I will be talking to you about a kind of rather challenging concept. Does vertebral bowel syndrome really exist, or is this a myth? Um, I'm going to start by defining uh, what is vertebral bowel syndrome. Uh, it's a functional uh, bowel disorder in which uh, abdominal pain and discomfort is associated with defecation and a change in bowel habits or features of uh, disordered defecation. Um, the significance of this diagnosis is the size. 15% of the population in the United States and maybe in the world, and let me say 15% of people right here probably have been diagnosed at some point in their lives with vertebral bowel syndrome. Uh, it constitutes about 83% of people go to the primary physician, 50% in the GI practices, and what they decided to do was to make some criteria. They started with Rome criteria. And every so many years, they changed to Rome 2, then Rome 3. Now we are at Rome 4. And the issue here, we're trying to kind of like try to more define this entity. And the last uh, criteria, obviously, is the fourth is the abdominal pain is the mainstay of the diagnosis and uh, related to two of the three, either related to defecation, abdominal pain with a change in bowel habits, or the quality. And they decided that there are three types and now they added the fourth type. So it's either constipation uh, predominant, diarrhea predominant, mixed, and they left kind of a box code of unknown just in case they can come up with something new and they can squeeze it in there. Now, look at the therapeutic attempts that we've made for IBS diarrhea. Whenever you see a list like this, it reminds me of therapy for anti-dandruff shampoo. There are 20 of them, <laughs> none of them works. <laughs> look at this. It got, starts with an antidiarrheal agent, which is effectively a cork that stops your <laughs> symptoms. It doesn't really work, but it's good. It makes you feel good. All of my patients come in, they swallow this all the time. It doesn't work. Dietary restrictions, the FODMAP, this is the uh, diagnosis of diet du jour. Now, every so often we come up with a new thing because we get bored in gastroenterology. So, FODMAP is now the new thing. Uh, low glucose, low sugar, it makes you feel good. It doesn't distend your abdomen. I agree with that. I think it's great. Does it do anything for diarrhea? Zero. Antispasmodics, again, they take away the intensity of the spasm of the gut. They make you feel a little bit of a relief, but they really don't address the issue because they continue to have the problem. And then we became a little bit more advanced now with therapeutics getting into it. Remember, the size is so big, so the pharmaceuticals are salivating over this. They have this uh, alexodoline, uh, which is an opioid antagonist. It basically interferes with the brain gut pathway. It makes you feel a little better. It doesn't do much for the diarrhea, but we can use it. They've been approved. Uh, and again, there's another one, uh, Lotronex, which is Alostron, uh, 5-HT antagonist. The problem with this, of course, there was an ischemic colitis increase with uh, particularly older females. So that drug is now withdrawn from the general use in America, and only the gastroenterologists use it with limited use. So effectively, there's none. Now, then we go to a completely different direction. They had to go to the antidepressants, uh, you know, antidepressants, anti-anxiolytics. They got to work at some point. You know, also, if you give them cocaine, it will work too, you know. So, I mean, yeah, they, sure, they feel better. But uh, does it really do anything with diarrhea? Not really. Antibiotics, rifaximin, is the latest again on the table. And what you're really treating with rifaximin is SIBO, which is small bowel intestinal bacterial overgrowth. You really are not treating anything else beyond that. So what you do is you sterilize the gut with this antibiotic. It's great. It makes you feel good. It actually decreases diarrhea for a little while. But then you can't be on the antibiotics forever. 
So six weeks later, when you start eating, you're eating bacteria again. So you know what? You're introducing everything else. So you go back again. So they show up in my office one more time. Didn't really go. And again, the probiotics reality does not work. So what was, I was stuck, like a lot of the GI guys, they're stuck with this. I mean, we do a colonoscopy, we do stool analysis, everything is fine. The young woman is fine. So they're going to the bathroom six, seven, eight times a day. What is the striking thing? Is that it is usually postprandial. They eat, they go to the bathroom. They protect themselves by not eating. And if they eat anything, they have to make sure there's a bathroom mapping. They have to know where the bathrooms are. So if you have people with diarrhea, chronic diarrhea, they know every bathroom. They go to a supermarket, they want to know where the bathroom is. On the highway, they know exactly where the service stations are. They're obsessed with this because they don't want to embarrass themselves. They want to know, and that's a term that I introduced in one of my publications, the bathroom mapping, which is a wonderful term, I think. It describes the patients exactly where things are. There shouldn't be any bleeding. Bleeding is a red flag sign of not having any bleeding. Bleeding is not part of any of this. And the abdominal pain, which is the mainstay of the diagnosis of IBS, supposedly, well, how could you have diarrhea and abdominal activity without having some kind of discomfort? So almost impossible to have that. This is the striking one. This is really what drove me into it. I said, hey, I'm missing something. And I figured, you know, I have some of my colleagues, I said, perhaps I was drunk when I was in medical school and I missed a session somewhere along the line. But there's something happening here. So I started looking into it, a little bit thinking beyond the box to see what can I, what's, what am I missing? Here? And that's the time when I came up with 19 patients, only 19 patients in the year 2000, I collected those. And I found that they all have the same striking thing, very similar to post polycystectomy patients. We've all known that 10% of people, after removal of the gallbladder, they have these symptoms. So I said, hang on a minute. What if they have these symptoms, but the gallbladder is just not working? It's intact, but it's not working. No pain, it's just not working. And we have a method, a standard method. I didn't come up with this, which is measuring the contractility of the gallbladder with a HIDA scan. It's a standard radiological method. And if we have below 50%, it's not working. Anything above 50%, it is working. So we published that in the year 2000 at the American Journal of Gastroenterology. And if you think about it, it's effectively dysfunctional gallbladder is like a dysfunctional thermostat. You know, the gallbladder, you know, it, when you eat, it controls how much bile you need. If it's not working, there's inappropriate secretion of bile. So you have a gush, which is bile that's coming from the liver. And that's what happens when you remove the gallbladder. And bile is a laxative. Bile goes to the small intestine, to the terminal ileum. The terminal ileum says, I can't handle so much bile. So they end up with diarrhea. So they don't eat, and that's what happens. So then I said, well, maybe 19 patients was a fluke. It was only 19 patients. What kind of a study is this? So I took 575 patients of mine over the years, and I went back and analyzed them. And 303 patients were included in the study because some of those patients did not fill up the criteria. They didn't do all the tests that I wanted them to do. And lo and behold, and what did I come up with? I came up with 41% of them actually have a syndrome, which is shocking. And 23% are post-cholecystectomy. Now, the post-cholecystectomy patients do not have to have diarrhea within a year or immediately or two years. For some unknown reason, and I haven't come up with a reason for that, they can have diarrhea many years after. I don't know why, but they can you know, present like that. And then there's, of course, the other criteria. Some of them are lactose intolerant, microscopic colitis, celiac disease, medications, long-term traveling, um, parasitic infestations. It's just so many of them. So if you put things into perspective and you look at this, bile-related diarrhea, bile acid malabsorption presenting with diarrhea. Look at that. There's 60 Six, 68% of patients, that three, almost three quarters of them, or two thirds are diarrhea, uh, diarrhea presenting with that. 
So the treatment for the syndrome that I came up with is nothing that I can take credit for. It's always been known that if we have post cholecystectomy diarrhea, we give them bile binding agents. What it does, it binds the bile. It takes away the character of the laxative character, if you will, and the patient improves. So I said, why don't I use the same thing? And that's exactly what I did. The response rate on that was 98%. So you have people walking into my office that are wearing diapers at the age of 17, 18, that cannot live their normal lives. They are miserable. They cannot attend a concert. They cannot travel. They have fear of eating. And you change that to 98% improvement. This is quite dramatic. The usual Conventional therapy gives you about only 30% with all the slew of uh, therapeutic agents that we tried to use before. And here, what we're really trying to emphasize is an awful lot to be said for the bile acid induced diarrhea. 68% of them between Harper syndrome, post cystectomy, or idiopath idiopathic bile uh, secretion. And I want to also remind you that about 5% of people had more than one condition. Presented the same way, they had maybe lactose intolerance, post cholecystectomy, Harvard syndrome, celiac disease, any of those. In conclusion, further workup needs to be done. You cannot accept IBS as a diagnosis. IBS is a collection of different treatable conditions. It's really a wastebasket and a catch all diagnosis. So what does that all mean? IBS stands for it's BS. <laughs> there is no such thing to call that. Yet. Give it up. If we stay away from that diagnosis, I think you will be the apostles of health for millions of people that are really striving and to change their lives. And you will be the person that will change their lives. You have no idea what you can do for these patients and how miserable they are. Diarrhea is not fashionable. Nobody talks about it, but you ought to do that. Thank you very much.